All of you are members of the supporters club, you've been with us for a long time, it's been a long, long haul, but we've now got a running car, and next year we're going to go fast, seriously fast. <laughs> Some might say you're going to go fast this afternoon, because 200 plus miles an hour the other day. Amazing statistic, ladies and gentlemen, more people have walked on the moon than have travelled on land at more than 600 miles an hour. So you're in a, it's, it's quite an exclusive club, Richard. Yeah, it really is. I mean, I suppose really in terms of uh, who's left, really, <laughs> it's uh, Andy Green, it's myself, and uh, Craig Greenlaw. Craig Greenlaw, yeah. yeah. What, what makes the likes of yourself and Andy and Craig Brewglove want to drive what are prototype cars at those kinds of speeds? <laughs> it really is, because not only is it the driving side of it, but there's all the innovation side. And I, I basically come from an age, you know, when we used to build uh, uh, very advanced aeroplanes in Britain, things like the TSR-2, the Concorde, the Lightning, the Vulcan Bomber, all these amazing things. And um, uh, this is our opportunity to do something similar. Um, it's kind of quite illegal, people like it. Uh, Britain's held the land speed record longer than anybody else, so it's absolutely fantastic. And we have an opportunity to build these wonderful things. And of course, uh, the Bloodhound is absolutely the ultimate in this. I mean, it really is. It goes 200 miles an hour faster than the Eurofighter uh, at 3,000 feet. And it's, um, it's the world's first car with 100 megawatts of power. Okay, And it's, um, that's more power in that car than the new British aircraft carrier. So let's put that in perspective. <laughs> and, it's, and it's done by a very, very small team of people, and it's not BAE Systems. <laughs> it just beats me at 650 miles an hour. So Andy isn't going to have a problem with thousands. I mean, you know, obviously the human body's really up to this. <laughs> so you, you, you achieved what you achieved in, in 1983, and, uh, and then initially your thoughts were that the uh, the uh, thrust SSC was was a car that potentially you could go back and maybe break your own world record. It didn't happen in the end for, for, for numerous reasons. Yeah, that's actually right. Um, basically, what was happening at the time was that uh, the McLaren Formula One people had got their Maverick project, and they were running around telling everybody how wonderful they were and how much money they got to spend on it, etc. And when a company behaves like that, you know they're going to fail. So uh, that's the first thing. <laughs> Second, we've got the Americans, who that's Craig Breedlove, and they were all really, really fired up, and Craig's a great American hero, and so on, so, uh, you know, this looked, looked good. So we decided we would take them on. And the most important person in all this is Ron Ayers, who will be floating around here somewhere. And Ron is the aerodynamicist, and with Ron's help, we did the first ever computational fluid dynamics for a car, ever, and then we proved it with the rocket testing. And those of you who've seen the video, you'll see the car accelerate, the model car accelerate from zero to 820 miles an hour in 0.8 per second. So it's a little bit faster than Jeremy Clarkson. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then we got all the data. So then we knew we could do it. We got a really good air, top rate aerodynamicist. We'd, uh, we'd done this competition for aerodynamics. We proved everything. And now went out to sell the, the idea. And I ran into trouble straight away. Because what was happening was all these big British companies were telling everybody how wonderful they are, and how capable and innovative and creative. So I, you know, so uh, I called their bluff and I went to see them and I said, here we are, we're going to break the sign barrier. Now, nah, what about that? And uh, they were absolutely terrified. <laughs> and uh, it was quite clear we were going to have a very, very difficult ride. And uh, so basically I had to really say to myself, well, you know, what we've got to do now is to, uh, I've got to step back from the driving and I've got to just concentrate now on getting the car built and so on. It wasn't going to be the easy run, I rather hoped it was. So um, yeah, we got there in the end and it did the most wonderful job and it was a fantastic team. And just uh, being there on the desert, 
um, with all the media there, seeing this car come up faster than sound in complete silence. And then it comes alongside you and you get the huge double bang. And the double bang can be heard 40 miles away. And in the little school in, the, in, the, in, the, in uh, Gerlach town, which was 15 miles away, it was knocking the covers off the sprinklers in the classrooms. <laughs> so now this is proper motorsport, you know, not this sort of wimpy run the run stuff. <laughs> We've got where we are today. That's taken an enormous amount of hard work. There's, there's some great news coming up as well. Already, you know, to, to get to this point, enormous amount of hard work. Still lots to do, but there's some... Well, there's holiness. And uh, what, what is actually happening is the video is going out to 140 countries. People are sending me emails from all over the world. Yeah, we've seen you in Los Angeles. There's a lot of coverage there. Yeah, we've seen you in New Zealand. Um, it, there's some enormous amount in the Middle East. That's absolutely amazing. <laughs> And now we realize now, and the one or two things which have just happened, but now we realize now we can do it. We can do it. And so the team have decided what we're going to do is we're going to do high speed runs next year. Okay? So we've got to, <laughs> we've got to be ready for this. Uh, we will be telling everybody where we're going to go and uh, how fast we're going to go and what the program is uh, as soon as we've got it sort of tidied up. And then I hope you'll come and join us because uh, you know this is uh, this is really something to experience. It really is. It's once in a lifetime. Now Richard might not thank me, thank me for this, and he doesn't know it's coming. But we need to make sure that Bloodhound keeps trending globally. Okay. Hashtag Bloodhound is go. And I think one of the best selfies that we could get is. Richard Noble looking back at you guys because without you guys it wouldn't happen. So Richard, if I turn my camera around. Good afternoon, just everybody. Welcome to Cornwall Airport UK. It's brilliant to see all of you here. I'm really sorry we haven't managed to repeat yesterday's lovely weather, but we are going to have a really good show for you anyway. You've now been down here at, uh, at Cornwall Airport Newquay for a few weeks uh, with the, the, the static and the dynamic runs. We saw you in front of the public make the, 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 the world debut of this car just a couple of days ago. Is it starting to feel as though it's a, a bit like home now, the car? Because obviously, you know, a new car, new feel to it, new things to try and understand? Well, it's something. Uh, first of all, a huge thank you to Cornwall Airport Newquay and to all the support we've had here. It's been absolutely brilliant. You know, why would you develop something like a technology and aero hub down here? Why would you promote this as a UK spaceport? I can tell you why. We brought the world's most advanced car down here for its initial testing. This is its home right now. Bloodhound is operational here. Bloodhound is go, thanks to the fabulous facilities and support we've had here at Newquay. And it does feel like home. We've got the workshops over there in, uh, in one of the houses, one of the old uh, Cold War ex-military ones. Last time I was there, I was actually flying a... Uh, a a uh, tornado jet fighter from that very has. Now we're operating the world's most sophisticated straight line racing car, and we've done literally a few, uh, you know, a couple of weeks of static engine testing, testing the brakes on the taxiway just down here, checking the steering. We have, I think, done four or five runs on the runway so far, including the two runs on uh, on Thursday, touching 200 miles an hour. So that is as much as the car's done. You are still seeing us doing research and testing on this car. The difference today is that on Thursday, the wind was from that direction. Now it's going that way. So I'm going to repeat exactly the same profile and we'll see what we get. I reckon you might just see the car going faster than it ever has been today. <laughs> just, just talk us through you know, the, 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 the wind. Does, does it affect the car much? I'm, I'm guessing it's a head-on wind or a tailwind, not so much as a side wind with a large rear wing on it. Uh, it, uh, well, that's one of the thing, key things we wanted to test was to understand the, uh, the start to understand the aerodynamic effects. And particularly, if it was a really big crosswind today, if we'd have 15, 20 miles an hour of crosswind, would that stop us running? A lot of you come a very long way. Um, has anybody come further than Sweden? I met a Swedish gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you have all come a long way, I've no. Um, it's brilliant to see you all here. We needed to put a show on. So we needed to understand, could we run on a wet runway? Yes, we can. Hopefully it's not going to be wet today. Uh, can we run in a crosswind? Initially, the car was moving around a little bit because we were running it without the tail fin. <laughs> then, last week, we actually fitted the tail fin, did some test runs last Friday, and the car is absolutely rocks. It actually handles better with the tail fin on, which is good news because that's what it was designed to do. <laughs> so, we're very comfortable with the, uh, with the crosswinds. The head and tail wind makes relatively uh, smaller differences to the handling, but it does make a difference to the straight line performance. Clearly with the wind helping you, you accelerate a little bit faster. It sounds crazy to say, you know, 10 mile an hour wind is going to affect a five ton 
200 mile an hour car, but it does make a small difference, just a few percent, but a few percent of 200 is still a measurable amount. So to give you some idea, from starting just over there, or letting the brakes off, the car will get up to 200 miles an hour in about eight seconds. By that stage, I have to have throttled back some time ago, put the brakes on, and then roll the car back down to slow speed. Anything below 50 miles an hour for this car is pretty much stationary. Uh, that is going to take an extra four to 500 feet today, just because the, tail, the wind is 10 miles an hour behind us, rather than in front. Because the car is peaking at a slight, slightly higher speed, possibly, and we'll have the wind helping it, so it does make a difference. You're largely going to be, of course, driving the car in the hat ski pan in South Africa, entirely different surface to the runway here at Cornwall Airport, Newquay. So, operating here must bring its own unique challenges, regardless of the wind direction and the, and, and the speeds. You're correct. It is a very different environment. We're going to be running the solid metal wheels on the desert. We'll, uh, we'll be running all of the bodywork, as you can see from the car today. We're missing the bodywork at the front because the rubber tyres we need to run on a concrete runway are actually very slightly wider, so we actually can't get the front bodywork on. That is actually a good thing because we're putting so much energy into the brakes here. If we had them inside an enclosed body, we would have a real heat management problem. So one of the advantages of leaving them off is to keep the brakes cool. We're going to do two runs back to back today, and on the second run, the, uh, the brake temperature will peak somewhere close to a thousand degrees centigrade. Um, how many people watch Formula One? Context for today, they are just small slow cars that go round and round in circles. <laughs> <laughs> this is an interesting car that goes fast. <laughs> but we still use the same sort of braking technology. The carbon car disc brakes, you see them glowing bright red on Formula One cars. Our brakes will get close to being white hot by the end of the second run. And we've got some, uh, some clips already online, if you haven't seen them, showing you the braking, showing the brakes starting to cook up and get hotter and hotter. That's one of the advantages of leaving the bodywork off. Uh, uh, unlike those slow cars that go round and round in circles and run the same brakes, and you don't get a green flag warming up lap, so you can't get any temperature into those brakes prior to the first run. So there must be an enormous amount of braking performance in run number two that you just don't get in run number one when the, the brakes are going from cold. There would be, and that's one of the things I have to allow for. Um, when we start the car up, it's actually pointing that way, uh, because the turning circle of the car, of course, is designed for the desert. This is the equivalent of a drag racing strip for a lap speed record car, and that's pretty much what we're going to try and do. So I'm going to take it down to the end of the airfield, go all the way around the outside of the perimeter track, around the taxiway, drive it back up the uh, mile and a half to the other end, while you guys are all out there in your viewing position, then I'll drive around the big uh, circle at the end and line the car up. Brakes are still pretty much cold. Those of you who watch Formula One, the rest of them don't take my word for it. Cold carbon disc brakes do nothing when you put them on. They need to heat up. And I haven't had a chance to heat them. So the profile is, is I'll hold the car on the brakes, accelerate the jet engine, just spin the, uh, the turbine up to somewhere close, or approaching uh, maximum drive power. The car will start to roll forwards. Even with maximum braking on, they're doing nothing. Let the brakes off. Put full reheat on, about one, one and a half seconds later, reheat lights up, the car's going to be doing 30, 40 miles an hour at that stage. Three seconds later, the car will be doing 130 miles an hour. At 130 miles an hour, I select idle, because there's no connection between the throttle pedal and the engine. In a thrust SSC, the previous generations, it was a mechanical link and it physically moved the valve on the engine to shut the fuel off. With these digital fly-by-wire engines, they manage it in much more high performance because they manage their own fuel flow. So my throttle movement sends a request down to the engine, please select idle. The engine, because of the brilliant systems team, will get that message and will actually throttle back. It takes about a second to wind the flame, the reheat flame, down to zero, and about another second, second and a half, for the engine to wind down and stop producing thrust. Two and a half seconds of thrust at 30 miles an hour per second means that I throttle back at 130, and the car keeps accelerating to 200 miles an hour. So I have to anticipate that by 70 miles an hour. It's one of the things we find out in testing. I'm not just watching the, the, uh, the speed wind up at that point. The, car, the brakes are still stone cold at this point. So as soon as I throttle back, there's about a one, half second pause while I actually check that the, uh, the engine has received that message and the engine starts to wind down. And then immediately, left foot on the brake, and I put about half brake pressure, about 25 to 30 bar on, to start the carbon discs heating up. Gradually increasing the pressure so that as we hit 200 miles an hour, I'm getting up towards uh, normal brake pressure, about 45, 50 bar, 
and the brakes are now above 300 centigrade, and that's where they start to bite. So the timing in that two or three seconds is really critical to make sure that the car not only gets up to speed, but also starts slowing down again. It sounds unbelievable, the amount of task and process that you have to go through out there uh, and Richard Noble was saying, you know, sort of time speed, that's time sort of slows down whilst you're, you're out there travelling at the speeds that you're doing. Now, when it comes to the cockpit, you've had a huge influence on the design and the layout of the cockpit, so that you'll largely see sort of almost a traffic light system for some of the critical things, rather than actually having to watch the dials, you'll see colours flash up, which give you the indication whether everything is within parameters or not. Yeah, and it's exactly the same technology as jet fighters. Now, I'm lucky enough to have the world's best day job flying jet fighters to the Royal Air Force. So that's very much the way that uh, you know, any aeroplane, particularly modern fast jets, work. There is so much going on that for critical things like having you know, the oils and the temperatures too hot or you know, the fuel is lower, you, you actually get a coloured light light up and actually warn you and to, uh, to use the fuel for instance, when we get, a, get down to 10% fuel, there's a little orange caption comes up and just says fuel low. You know, even my simple pilot's brain can understand that. <laughs> So it's, it's, it's designed to be as simple as possible. That lets me focus on the important things like the exact amount of jet power I've got, the temperature of the brakes, exactly how fast we're going down the runway, the, the really important things. What happens if the electrics fail and you can't see any of that? Well, the, the great news is that uh, the, an electric failure will actually, you know, we've looked at that, that everything defaults to a safe position. So for instance, key thing to slow the car down. The brakes are unassisted manual brakes. I won't actually then have is a total electrical failure, I won't be able to see the brake pressure, but I will know to put about the right amount of pressure on, and from where I'm turning off on the runway here, we have another uh, you know, 1,500, 2,000 feet of stopping distance available. That is all the safety margin we've built in for that kind of emergency. The other problem, of course, is, as I said, we've got no direct connection with the engine. So what power setting will the engine go to? Uh, it would depend on the type of failure we have. Whatever it is, if it goes anywhere other than idle, then I'm physically, some of you have seen the cockpit, there's a big lever on the right hand side that looks like a massive great shiny throttle. Actually, it's exactly the opposite. If the engine stops anywhere other than at low power, I can physically shut the fuel off using that lever and actually kill the engine stone dead. And that is, you know, this is not about going really fast and hoping we don't crash. This is about running a really safe car, then seeing how fast we can go. And you've got the world's best, I've seen the photographs that I'm sure many of you have on social media as well, you've got the world's best, best speedometer as well, a, a manual Rolex chronograph. It, it, it looks stunning inside the cockpit. It would be very lucky. The, the cockpit reflects the technology that has gone into the whole car. Three and a half thousand bespoke components built by 300 companies, both here in the UK and with uh, input where we needed to go outside the UK from the best in the world wherever they are. You'll be pleased to hear that about 98% of that world class expertise is UK based because we have got the world's best engineers in this uh, country. For those of you who do watch Formula One, if you have any doubts about that, who's leading, you know, who's just won a constructors champion, championship, a, a three-pointed star company who make their Mercedes, make their race cars in the UK. They're made by British engineers. Best part of that car is the race engine, which is made in the UK by British engineers. Now, don't let anybody ever tell you that we're anything other than the best in the world at things like motorsport, aerospace, because the evidence is just over there. We still hold a lead over anybody else. We've held the record for longer than every other nation put together. Even the Americans, with all of the technology, the jet engines, again, still haven't taken the record back since Richard Noble gave it in 1983. Be proud of the fact that great British engineering and technology is on display today. I think we just need the microphone slightly close to your mouth, and if we could. One, one, one final question as well. Having done the runs that you've done so far, and having completed that run on Thursday, what has surprised you most, and the engineers most, about the performance of the car compared to, of course, what was the computer-generated modelling of it? Uh, I'll give you three things that have been real surprises and real pleasant surprises. The first one was how much power we could get out of the engine. The, the intake is optimised for about 800, 850 miles an hour. It's actually quite small uh, for what we would, you know, it's, it's ideal for supersonic speeds. It's too small to feed the jet engine enough power to, to uh, put full power on on the runway, we thought. When we actually tested it, we found that engine is so good, even though we're starving it of air, because it's feeding through a small supersonic intake, it is still giving us full power. Good news for you today, you will get to see the big reheat flame coming out of the back. That's the first one. Second one is how good the car is. 
you know, first time we ran Trust SSC, we spent not just weeks, not even months, the whole of the program developing the car, fixing snags, making things work. This car just worked straight out of the box. It was pretty much, by the end of the first week, everything worked as you're going to see it today. It is, and it's been reliable, and it's done everything we wanted every single day. So the sheer, and, and, and it also handles like a, uh, like a racing car. First time I steered it, the chassis is stiff, the suspension is very well set up, the steering feels great. It feels like it's ready to go really fast from day one. So the, the, the performance of the car has been better in every respect than we expected. And the third, perhaps most important thing, the performance of the team has just been stunning. You know, we've got a, a bunch of guys who spent years designing and then building the world's best racing car. Then they come here and actually start running it as a race team for the first time and learning how to refuel it, how to tow it, how to service it, how to actually move it around. And within days, it looked like they've been doing this forever. Very slick, very professional team. Why is the car so good? Why is it so high performance? It's because of that team. So please do take the time to go and see our team and tell them just what a fabulous job they're doing because over there they have created something that is better than has ever been in the history of the land speed record and it's all down to them. And that team as well, you know, you, this is a live test, you're testing the car, but they are also going through their process of testing their roles from when they head out into the hack scheme pad as well. It's a test for them. Yeah, absolutely right. We're not just testing the race car here to see if it's okay. We're actually training a land speed record team to go out and do extraordinary things in South Africa, you know, and to showcase that great British engineering and technology on a global stage and to push the land speed record not just to a bigger number, but to the limit of modern technology, to a speed that no one has ever seen before, and share it with a global audience of tens of millions of people at the same time. You know, if you look really closely, when the car parks back in, when, when we finish driving it round in circles around the airfield, I'll park it nose in where it is now, and just in front of the left-hand wheel is a whole bunch of horizontal black strips, and they are aerials uploading the data from the car to the cloud. Thanks to Oracle, people all over the world, by the time you come back here and see the car parked, the data from the car is already being accessed all over the world. That has never been done before. The car is not just a race car, it is the largest open source engineering experiment in history and it's happening right here today. So thank you very much for coming to watch. We wish you all the very best. <laughs> Thank you. 